Hello to everyone. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, Education Specialist of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to this presentation in the AS3M Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Learning Guide in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation is by Dr. Ranjith Ramasamy. Dr. Ramasamy resides at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, where he is the Director in Male Reproductive Urology. The title of his talk is Microsurgery for Male Fertility, Case-Based Discussion. I will now review the details of today's presentation. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credits. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. If you wish to ask a question to the speaker about the presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled Questions, and an email address will be provided. The question period will be open for uh, some time after this presentation is posted. After the time period for questions has expired, the questions page will become a frequently asked questions page pertaining to this presentation and topic. We're very excited for our speaker today, so I will now turn things over to him. Thank you to ASRM and thank you, uh, Jeff, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, today we're going to uh, discuss about uh, the use of microsurgery for male fertility. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, three uh, cases in which uh, the role of microsurgery would help uh, men achieve uh, successful uh, pregnancies with their partners. I have no disclosures uh, pertaining to the stock. The objectives for today's presentation are to develop a systematic approach to the evaluation of individual cases of male fertility. Uh, we're going to present some of the guidelines for the different, different diagnostic and genetic tests that are available for male fertility. And finally, we're going to con consider some of the treatment options that are available for men with Klinefelter syndrome and discuss some of their benefits and risks. The first case, this is a 28-year-old male that uh, comes into your office with a history of infertility. He has an unremarkable medical history and has had no prior pregnancies. His uh, semen analysis, he brings in uh, with him a report that shows oligospermia, which is a concentration of 14 million sperm per cc, which is less than the 15 million established by the WHO. A motility of 38%, again, this is less than 40% established uh, by the WHO. Morphology is 5% and that is normal, and the volume uh, is 3 cc's and that is also within the normal limits. So a little low sperm concentration and a little less motility compared to the WHO guidelines. So the next step in the evaluation of this man with uh, impaired or abnormal semen analysis is to do a focused physical examination and importantly is to repeat the semen analysis at a laboratory that you trust. Several of the semen analysis these days are performed at commercial laboratories using computerized systems which may not be accurate um, and has to be repeated at a laboratory that you trust with an andrologist that is trained. So on his focused physical exam, you identify a large uh, left-sided varicocele, and when the semen analysis is repeated, uh, the concentration is now uh, 16 million sperm per cc, and the motility is about 42%. Again, this is more than the 15 million established, and the motility is 42%, which is more than the 40% as uh, put forth by the WHO. The volume and the morphology remain uh, normal, and they are uh, comparable to the previous semen analysis that the patient has brought in with you. So let's review uh, these two uh, separate semen analysis and figure out where these semen parameters actually came from and how the WHO uh, came up with these so-called normal values. So interestingly, the WHO uh, took a total of 2,000 couples from three different continents, and the only uh, requirement that they needed to have was these men were able to get their partners pregnant within the last one year. And the WHO decided that the fifth percentile, uh, 
after they plotted every man on a bell curve or the semen analysis on a bell curve and decided that this was going to be the norms that was established. And at the fifth percentile, we see that the uh, semen volume is 1.5, the sperm density or the sperm concentration is 15 million sperm per cc, and the motility is 40%. This is how the WHO came up with these numbers. Interestingly, this is from a large bell curve, like I said, and the 5% mark is where the 15 million and the 40% in motility came from. And if you look at the 50, 50th percentile, which a lot of people would consider as average, the concentrations are close to 75 million and 60% uh, motility when it comes to uh, sperm concentration and sperm motility. And this is important to understand because a lot of people, uh, as physicians, we're all used to uh, talking about normal and abnormal when it comes to blood pressure, when it comes to blood sugar, when it comes to most laboratory values. We all have an, our, a cutoff that's established and that we put, like to put patients into black and white. Unfortunately, semen analysis should not be interpreted that way because the, there is no absolute cutoff which makes a normal and no cutoff that makes the semen analysis abnormal. These are the fifth percentile cutoffs that the WHO established and we should, as physicians, try to stay away from uh, using the word normals and abnormals when we're trying to interpret semen analyses. So let's go back and review our case. So this is the 28-year-old guy, comes in with his 25-year-old healthy wife. She has no, abs no abnormalities at all. And the first semen analysis shows 14 million sperm per cc and 39% motility. And the second semen analysis shows 16 million sperm per cc and 41% motility. And this case I'd like to illustrate because the WHO fifth percentile is 15 million and 40% uh, motility. And I'd like to hopefully illustrate that both these semen analysis is the, in this young man with a large varicocele and his young wife should be considered abnormal and treatment should be offered. And just because he has 1 million sperm per cc more than the fifth percentile and 1% more motility than the uh, fifth percentile, he should not be considered normal and not offered evaluation or, more importantly, treatment. So let's review what varicoceles are. So varicoceles are basically dilated veins in the spermatic cord. The overarching hypothesis of how varicoceles affect infertility is, is because we believe that the temperature around the testis increases and the testis is outside the body and technically has a lower temperature around 34 degrees C compared to the core body temperature, which is around 37 degrees C. And now there is new literature showing that varicoceles can affect not just sperm production and sperm motility, but also testosterone production from the lytic cells. So how are varicoceles classified? This is very important because this is what determines whether men get treated or don't get treated. There are clinical varicoceles and subclinical varicoceles. And with clinical varicoceles, they're graded into grade 3, 2, and 1. Grade 3 is a large varicocele, the one that is easily visible, like the pictures that I just showed. Grade 2 varicocele is palpable at rest without valsalva. And grade 1 is palpable only with valsalva. And as one can imagine, larger varicoceles are associated with larger impairments in semen parameters. And fixing larger varicoceles will also help uh, achieve a better improvement in semen parameters. And the subclinical varicoceles are those varicoceles that are absolutely not palpable on physical exam. However, there is an ultrasound report that patients often get done, either by their primary care doctor or another urologist, which shows the presence of a varicocele. The important distinction that one has to make is that in repairing subclinical varicoceles, the improvement in semen parameters is not significant. So therefore, the, the distinction between clinical versus subclinical has to be made clearly because treatment of clinical varicoceles would actually be would actually result in improved semen parameters. So the AUA, <coughs> the American Urological Association, has put forth very clear indications on who a varicocelectomy or treatment for varicocele should be offered. Number one, like I just discussed, the varicocele should be palpable and therefore clinical. 
Um, number two, the couple needs to be uh, have documented infertility. Uh, number three, the female should have either normal fertility or potentially correctable infertility. And this is important to know because sometimes uh, the women have uh, are older or have poor ovarian reserve and uh, would probably need assisted reproduction one form or the other. And postponing their uh, treatment in attempts to fix the varicocele in those circumstances may not be uh, the appropriate thing to do. And number four, the male partner needs to have at least one or more abnormal semen parameters. I think, uh, again, we are going back into this question of normal versus abnormal, but I think most urologists are very comfortable identifying a totally normal semen analysis versus something uh, that is borderline like what we presented. So the big question comes, does varicocele repair improve male fertility? I think there are several studies that show that varicocelectomy can improve semen parameters. However, there are very, very few studies that actually show that varicocelectomy can improve uh, natural conception or uh, pregnancy rates. And this is one uh, randomized controlled trial that was published in 2010 showing that varicocelectomy was superior to observation in men with palpable varicoceles and impaired semen quality. They took a total of 100 men in each arm and followed them out for 12 months. In one group, they had a total of 100 men who underwent varicocelectomy, and in another group, they had 100 men who did not undergo varicocelectomy and were just observed. And interestingly, they found that in the control group, in men who did not have varicocelectomy, the spontaneous pregnancy rate was about 14% at the end of one year, compared to 33% at the end of one year in the group of men that underwent varicocelectomy. So the odds ratio of a successful pregnancy was about three times at one year, and the number needed to treat was about six patients successfully to have one successful pregnancy. So this is the best data that we have out there to de demonstrate that varicocelectomy actually improves natural conception rates. Now how does varicocelectomy uh, change um, the uh, success of uh, natural conception? There are two studies that discuss that varicocele does not just change the actual sperm number, but could actually change uh, sperm DNA integrity. And two studies, one from Canada and one from Netherlands, both demonstrating that microsurgical varicocelectomy can actually improve DNA fragmentation. And if it decreases DNA fragmentation, it appears to be associated with an increase in pregnancy rate. So both these studies and several others corroborate the findings that varicocele not just changes the absolute sperm concentration and sperm uh, motility and semen parameters, but actually improves sperm quality and more importantly, sperm DNA quality as well. So let's switch gears from natural conception to assisted reproduction, and I'm going to discuss two studies in which varicocelectomy appears to improve both intrauterine insemination, success rates, and uh, IVF with ICSI. First study here, this is a, a, a retrospective uh, study, obviously has a lot of selection bias, but shows that in the group of men that underwent varicocele repair, an IUI success rate was close to 30% compared to the group of men in which did not undergo varicocele repair, the IUI success was about 40%. So the odds of pregnancy was about four times higher in men that were treated with varicoceles, and the odds of a live birth was about 13 times higher in men that got treated with varicoceles. And even when we look at IVF with ICSI, it is uh, not surprising that in after varicocele repair, the sperm count and the sperm motility improved, but the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate also appeared to improve in men that underwent varicocelectomy and then followed by ICSI compared to men that underwent, did not undergo varicocele repair and underwent ICSI directly. So let's move on to figure out how we can uh, treat the varicocele effectively. Uh, there are three most commonly used approaches. One is embolization. Uh, two is with uh, microsurgical varicocelectomy, and three, uh, laparoscopic varicocelectomy, which is uh, most commonly used in the uh, pediatric population. This is a nice table demonstrating the different techniques of varicocelectomy. When you're discussing varicocele repair, you have to discuss the risks of 
uh, testicular artery injury, uh, possibility of a hydrocele because of uh, lymphatic impairment, and the possibility of uh, failure and a recurrence rate at the uh, following uh, varicocele uh, treatment. So it's uh, when you look at microsurgical or inguinal or subinguinal varicocelectomy, the artery is often preserved because the use facilitates the use of microdoppler and the microscope. Uh, the percentage of hydrocele is very rare because often we're able to identify lymphatics and spare them and the failure rate appears to be uh, very low compared to all the other techniques of a varicocele treatment. So the microsurgical uh, inguinal or subinguinal approach appears to be the gold standard. And this often comes up as to how long should we wait after varicocele uh, treatment to identify changes in semen parameters um, and this is and an the nice study from Canada basically shows that we should wait for about uh, three months after which uh, the varicocele repair should show some changes and the changes still happen after uh, up to six to twelve months but the uh, most significant change happens within the first three months after repair. So this concludes the uh, first case. Hopefully uh, we have uh, touched upon several topics on identifying and distinguishing distinguishing a normal from abnormal uh, semen analysis, uh, distinguishing between a clinical versus subclinical varicocele, and we went over the indications of varicocele repair and the different approaches to treat varicocelectomy. Let's move on to the uh, next case. This is a case of azospermia, meaning zero sperm in the ejaculate. This is a 33-year-old healthy male with a 31-year-old healthy wife. He is uh, azoospermic on several semen analysis and on exam uh, he has bilateral 4cc testis. And uh, the normal testis volume is between 15 to uh, 20 cc's. So with a 4cc testis we know we are dealing with uh, very small testes and uh, no sperm in the ejaculate. He has a hormonal evaluation which shows uh, an FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, of a level of 25, and LH that is uh, 5, LH is luteinizing hormone. His testosterone is a little uh, low, but however, on the, uh, within the normal range, his prolactin and his estradiol are all within normal limits. So we're dealing with someone with uh, very small testes and a very high FSH and has azoospermia. One of the first steps in uh, evaluating a man with azoospermia should be to identify whether this is obstructive azoospermia or non-obstructive azoospermia, or also called azoospermia due to a production defect. And that's the first distinction you have to make. In the past, people used to do a diagnostic testis biopsy to distinguish between these two diagnoses but a, a very important study by uh, Craig Niederberger and his group in 2002 showed that if you use two parameters, one um, an FSH uh, cut point of 7.6 uh, in their laboratory and a testicular long axis of 4.6 centimeters or lower, then you could identify 90% uh, of men with non-obstructive azoospermia or azoospermia due to uh, production failure. So just based on an FSH level and size of the testis, 90% of the time uh, we can safely conclude that this uh, man will have azoospermia or not due to a production defect. So in someone with high FSH and a small testis, this azoospermia is likely due to production defect and this paper changed uh, the way we manage uh, these patients in that we should not be doing a diagnostic biopsy uh, to uh, diagnose these men with uh, azoospermia. So let's move on with our case. The most important parts obviously are his small testis, his high FSH, and I think we're fairly certain uh, with these two parameters alone that this his diagnosis is non-obstructive azoospermia. One of the next steps to think about uh, in this patient is whether uh, medical therapy uh, would be indicated uh, in this man. And medical therapy in uh, male fertility uh, unfortunately has not been studied as much and most of these studies have focused around uh, improving uh, intratesticular testosterone production or testosterone to estradiol conversion blockade. So the two most commonly used uh, drugs in uh, male fertility are clomiphene citrate 
just to review the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, the hypothalamus produces GnRH. GnRH acts on the anterior pituitary to make FSH and LH. FSH acts on Sertoli cells to support spermatogenesis. LH acts on the lytic cells to produce testosterone. And testosterone gets converted to estradiol, mostly within the testis, using an enzyme called aromatase. So now clomiphene citrate acts at the uh, hypothalamus and the pituitary to basically block the uh, negative feedback provided by the estradiol, so therefore increases testosterone uh, production from the testis. Anastrozole, on the other hand, blocks the conversion of testosterone to estradiol and therefore increases intratesticular testosterone. And it's important to know that idiopathic male fertility uh, treatment with uh, Antioxidants, uh, the evidence is usually is just empiric, unfortunately, and we need uh, much better controlled trials with uh, defined outcomes before we can start recommending uh, antioxidants for men with infertility on a routine basis. So who is the appropriate candidate for <coughs> medical therapy, at least with clomiphene citrate or with an astrozole? Let's review some cases and figure out who we should give it to and who we should not give it to. First case is a 32-year-old guy with either oligospermia or azospermia. His testosterone is 270 and it is uh, below the normal range of the laboratory. Let's say we've repeated it twice. His FSH is a little high compared to uh, the 2 to 8 normal level in the lab. The LH is normal and the estradiol is also normal. So in this guy with a normal LH level and a low testosterone level, he uh, should be treated with uh, clomiphene citrate. I like to use it at 25 milligrams, which is half a tablet uh, every other day, uh, just because some of the side effects associated with uh, fluid retention, fatigue, and gynecomastia uh, that happens with the uh, 50 milligram dose. So let's take another patient. So this is a guy that has a low testosterone, uh, 270. His FSH is a little high. However, his estradiol is also very high and the T2E ratio is 2.7, normal ratio is around 10 and in him I think treating him with both clomiphene citrate to increase the testosterone production as well as the LH production and giving him an astrozole one milligram every other day to block the testosterone to estradiol conversion is totally appropriate. And finally, this is a patient with a normal testosterone level, 480, uh, between 300 to 800. His FSH is high, his LH is high, and the estradiol is normal. And this is the, actually the most uh, typical patient that we see in clinic uh, who have testicular failure. Often the lytic cells appear to function just fine, and the uh, germ cells are not functioning as well, uh, resulting in either oligospermia or azospermia. And it's important to know that uh, men with normal testosterone and an elevated LH, uh, just like in this setting, should not be started on clomiphene citrate uh, because it will not help uh, drive the axis any further and more importantly, should not help increase uh, sperm production. So let's go back to the hormonal evaluation in our patient. He's azospermic. He has an FSH of 25 and an LH of 15 and a normal testosterone level. And I think clomiphene citrate or an astrozole should not be indicated because of his uh, normal testosterone level and an elevated FSH and LH level with a normal estradiol. So hopefully uh, we have learned uh, who to give uh, clomiphene citrate to, who to give an astrozole to, and more importantly, who not to give these two drugs to, because these are not benign drugs. They do have uh, their side effects. So I think we are safe to conclude that in our patient, uh, no medical therapy is indicated. Uh, we should start thinking about uh, genetic testing, and I'm going to discuss as to what genetic tests are indicated in our patient and how uh, the results of the genetic tests could actually change management. So um, the AUA and uh, the EAU and the ASRM actually has very good guidelines on who should be offered genetic testing. I think men with sperm concentrations less than 5 to 10 million sperm per cc should be offered genetic testing as long as we have determined that this is uh, oligospermia or azospermia due to a production defect. Uh, the two tests that are offered are Y chromosome microdeletion testing and karyotype testing. 
And the other genetic test that is available is called CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator uh, genetic testing. This should be offered in men who have absent vas deferens on examination or they have idiopathic genital ductal obstruction um, that you are suspicious. And it's important to offer the testing to the partner first. Uh, we could assume that the male is affected because the carrier status of the partner would dictate whether the male needs to be uh, screened or not for this particular test. So when should we do genetic testing? And this is important. Uh, I don't think any man should ever have all three genetic testings offered to him because in patients who have oligospermia or azoospermia due to testicular failure, we should do a Y chromosome microdeletion and a karyotype. However, men who have typically normal volume testis, absent vas deferens, or you suspect idiopathic obstruction, there is no uh, given known cause for uh, obstructive azoospermia, then you should uh, think about cystic fibrosis uh, or CFTR testing, first in the partner and then in the patient. So why should we uh, do a karyotype testing? The most common karyotype abnormality is uh, something called Klinefelter syndrome 47XXY. It's an extra X chromosome that's uh, present due to a meiotic defect. Uh, these men typically have small testes. They have elevated gonadotropin levels, a low serum testosterone with varying symptoms of hypogonadism, and azoospermia, or less than 8% of uh, Kleinfelter patients usually have some few sperm in the ejaculate, but typically most of them have uh, azoospermia. We will review this in uh, more detail as we go along. The second uh, is the genetic test in this man should be done is the white chromosome microdeletion. This is an illustration of the white chromosome with uh, basically the short arm YP and the long arm YQ. In the long arm, there are three different regions of the chromosome which could potentially be deleted called AZF, stands for azoospermia factor A, factor B, and factor C. And it's important to know that if they have an AZF-A deletion, they sh could have, they will have germ cell aplasia and really no retrievable sperm. If it's AZFB complete deletion, then they typically have maturation arrest and should not have any retrievable sperm. However, with the AZFC, they could have hypospermatogenesis or pockets of sperm production. And Bob Oates has reported up to a 70% chance of retrieving testicular sperm, uh, and that can be used for men with uh, ICSI. So, how genetic testing changes uh, management. Uh, this is a very uh, nice uh, example that illustrates that in men who have AZFA or AZFB deletions, they should not be offered testicular biopsy or testicular sperm extraction as treatments. And however, men who have AZFC deletions should be offered uh, uh, microdissection testicular sperm extraction or testis biopsy and given hope for have fathering a biological child. So the next step uh, is we should be thinking about a testis biopsy and um, and how we do testis biopsies. And the next few slides I want to illustrate the role of a diagnostic testis biopsy in men with azoospermia. So in men with non-obstructive azoospermia, I think we're all very clear that we shouldn't be doing routine uh, diagnostic testis biopsies. Just as a reference, this is a seminiferous tubule which actually shows normal spermatogenesis and normal sperm production. And I want you to contrast this with a testis biopsy that was done on a man with non-obstructive azoospermia, wherein there is only one cell type, mostly Sertoli cells, and has no sperm production at all. So this is a biopsy that shows Sertoli cell only syndrome, which is devoid of uh, sperm cells or any germ cells. So, so the three different histologies that you should uh, find on a, on a histology or pathology report with, from the pathologist when you send off a biopsy uh, for diagnosis is three. One, you should uh, either see hypospermatogenesis, which is basically identification of uh, mature spermatids within a seminiferous tubule. The second is maturation and arrest, wherein you actually have germ cells, but you don't have the appearance of mature spermatids within the seminiferous tubule, and this is often due to uh, an underlying genetic defect. And finally, Sertoli cell only syndrome, wherein the tubules are devoid of all germ cells and have only one cell type, and uh, that is the Sertoli cell uh, 
which supports spermatogenesis, but unfortunately these men do not have any uh, sperm production. So the AUA has actually put forward very good guidelines on uh, the indications of testis biopsy. A testis biopsy is not necessary for the diagnosis or prognosis of men with non-obstructive vasospermia, meaning men who have small testes and high FSH, we should not be doing routine testicular biopsies. However, who should we do the biopsies on? Are men who have normal serum FSH levels should undergo a diagnostic biopsy because normal serum FSH does not necessarily mean they have normal spermatogenesis. Let me illustrate a very nice uh, case of a man in whom diagnostic biopsy is indicated. The 28-year-old guy that comes in with a history of scrotal trauma as a child, doesn't remember the exact events, is married to a 25-year-old female. They've been attempting conception for the last two years. On physical exam, the testis is normal size, about 18 cc, and the epididymis appears flat without any indurations. His semen analysis, his pH is uh, normal, his volume is normal, however, he is azospermic. And a hormonal evaluation, his FSH is normal, and the testosterone is also normal. So normal size testis, normal FSH with azospermia, I think, calls for a diagnostic uh, testis biopsy. And it's important because this diagnostic biopsy is indicated because we want to distinguish between maturation arrest, which is a production defect compared to uh, versus a normal spermatogenesis, which is often a transport defect. And this is how the different histologies would contrast. This is an illustration of maturation arrest where you see germ cells, but really no mature spermatids in contrast to uh, normal spermatogenesis wherein you see germ cells as well as mature spermatids within the lumen. The management of men with maturation arrest would be a testis biopsy with ICSI, and management of men with uh, normal spermatogenesis could be a potential uh, vasoepididymostomy, uh, which would help you uh, if there is evidence of epididymal obstruction. This could result from uh, scrotal trauma, as this patient has experienced. So, men who have undergone previous biopsies and then underwent final microdissection tesi, uh, we showed this uh, back in 2007, wherein uh, if the histology was Sertoli cell only, maturation arrest, or hypospermatogenesis, we were still able to identify uh, sperm in a significant proportion of patients, up to 50% in men who had Sertoli cell only histology. However, men who had three or greater diagnostic biopsies, the chance of microdissection uh, of identifying sperm on the therapeutic microdissection tesi uh, was much lower compared to men who had either no biopsies at all or had up to one to two biopsies within their testis. So this is important to understand that unindicated diagnostic biopsies, which could happen when patients go from one urologist to another, um, can impair sperm retrieval success with the eventual uh, therapeutic procedure. So hopefully I've illustrated the point that uh, diagnostic biopsies should not be done in men with azospermia due to uh, testicular failure. And the only biopsy that we should be planning is the therapeutic biopsy, wherein the uh, sperm would be used for assisted reproduction. So this man, uh, let's summarize now, he has uh, azospermia, small testis, a high FSH, his uh, biopsy that was done on the outside showed Sertoli cell only syndrome. His karyotype, uh, which we did, came back totally normal. His Y chromosome microdeletions also came back without any deletions. So now uh, we have to do uh, some sort of surgical therapy which would uh, help us in achieving sperm for use with assisted reproduction. The different surgical therapies that have been proposed for sperm retrieval are fine needle aspiration, percutaneous biopsy, open biopsy, as well as multiple open biopsies. And it's important to know that not all sperm retrieval procedures are the same. Uh, testis sperm aspiration is probably the least invasive, and uh, testicular biopsies, open testis biopsies, and finally, uh, microdissection tesi uh, is probably uh, the most invasive. But hopefully, over the next few slides, I can hope illustrate that despite being the most invasive, it's probably also the most uh, successful in terms of uh, data that has been reported. So what is sperm retrieval in uh, non-obstructive azospermia? This is a concept put forth by uh, Dr. Schlegel back in 1999, 
wherein a microscope could be used to identify sites of sperm production uh, without removing large areas of the testis randomly, also called microdissection uh, testicular sperm extraction. The procedure involves uh, bivalving uh, the testis and identifying the most advanced stages of spermatogenesis under the microscope. The goal is to identify uh, differences in a tubular size and uh, shape and architecture and hopefully tubules that are uh, larger and fuller as illustrated in this micrograph from Dr. Schlegel shows that uh, some areas would have spermatogenesis as opposed to the majority of the area surrounding here which in which tubules are flat and atrophic would be uh, Sertoli cell only syndrome and be devoid of germ cells. So the microscope is used to identify uh, the most advanced stage of somatogenesis within the testis, um, even though the most prevalent histology within the testis could probably be Sertoli cell only syndrome. So what are some of the effects of uh, microdissection testicular sperm extraction? We looked at the changes on ultrasound at, at three months and six months in men who underwent conventional biopsies as represented in the black uh, bars and microdissection tesis in the white bars. We showed that the percentage of uh, changes on ultrasound at both three months and six months were uh, lower with men who underwent microdissection tesi compared to men who underwent conventional open biopsies. And there's often questions about what happens to the testosterone levels in men who undergo microdissection tesi because we just described this as the most invasive procedure to obtain uh, sperm. The testosterone levels do drop in the first uh, three months following microdissection tesi. However, uh, in 12 to 18 months after uh, the procedure, majority of men are able to recover uh, their baseline testosterone production uh, successfully. We then went into the question of what are some of the preoperative predictors that could help us identify uh, men who will succeed with microdissection tesi because uh, FSH appears to be a very significant predictor of the presence or absence of somatogenesis. We wanted to see if FSH levels preoperatively could predict the uh, successful sperm retrieval with men who undergo microdissection tesi. These, uh, axes on the x-axis basically show the different FSH levels, less than 15, 15 to 25, all the way up to FSH greater than 45, and on the y-axis is successful sperm retrieval in percent. Interestingly, we found that men who had an FSH, uh, normal FSH level, actually had the lowest chance of successful sperm retrieval compared to men with an elevated FSH. So we concluded from this study that high FSH uh, should not be a contraindication for microdissection testicular sperm extraction. And this, we believe, is because a high FSH in a small testis probably aids us in identifying uh, tubules uh, much easier uh, and identify the tubules that are different much easier compared to men with uh, normal FSH and normal testis volumes in which uh, dissecting with a microscope through the entire tissue could pose a challenge. So what do we do with the testicular tissue as soon as it's obtained? It's dispersed uh, effectively with a mechanical dispersion uh, with the help of a 23-gauge uh, angiocath as well as iris scissors. And in uh, cases where we don't identify uh, sperm in the operating room, they're left overnight with uh, collagenase and a lysis buffer. And the sample is uh, incubated overnight with pentoxifiline to identify any uh, sperm in the morning. Typically, sperm retrieval is done uh, the day before egg retrieval uh, in, some, in cases where we have to do it on the same day as egg retrieval, uh, then obviously that there is a minimal time for collagenase, but a uh, majority of the times we are able to identify the sperm that are present uh, with, uh, with effective mechanical dispersion alone. So let's move on to the uh, last case uh, of the day. This is, uh, again, another case of azoospermia. I think we touched upon this a little bit, but I just wanted to discuss the management of this uh, uh, in a little bit more detail. This is a 33-year-old male who has a low libido and primary infertility. He has slight gynecomastia. On exam, he has a firm testes, which are approximately 3 cc's in volume, and the semen analysis shows azoospermia. Just based on the history and physical features, uh, we have to uh, make uh, the most likely diagnosis. And 
because of the gynecomastial, low libido, and small testes, we could probably uh, make the diagnosis as klein Felter syndrome. Uh, these men typically have a taller than average height, reduced facial and body hair, uh, gynecomastia and small testes. They often complain of fatigue, uh, depression, low libido, poor erections, and uh, the presenting complaint is usually infertility. And infertility is the first time uh, in several occasions wherein we identify Kleinfelder syndrome because not all men fit the exact phenotype all the time. So when you're suspicious of Kleinfelder syndrome, there are two things that you want to request. One is hormonal evaluation and two is chromosomal analysis. The first thing we want to do, these men often have a low testosterone level uh, with a high FSH because of their uh, feedback loop and the chromosomal analysis came back with a 47XXY pattern and suggestive and indicative of uh, men with Kleinfelter syndrome. So we discussed the uh, indications of genetic testing in the previous case, but I'd like to illustrate this further. Karyotype abnormalities can happen in up to 10 to 15 percent of all men with azoospermia, and Kleinfelter syndrome appears to be the most common genetic abnormality. When we look at white chromosome microdeletions, up to 13 percent of men with azoospermia or severe oligospermia can have white chromosome microdeletions. Um, and AZFA and B deletions, they should be recommended to undergo have either donor sperm or adopt because microdissection tesi has no value in these men. AZFC, there's up to a 70 percent chance of identifying sperm, rare sperm, but within the testis. So what are some of the next steps in the management of this uh, couple and this man with Kleinfelter syndrome? I think donor sperm and adoption should be discussed. And finally, we should discuss uh, medical therapy and uh, testicular sperm extraction with uh, the microscope. So we published one of the studies, uh, early studies on uh, microtesi and Kleinfelter syndrome uh, with Dr. Schlegel. About 114 attempts at sperm retrieval in about 88 men. Uh, sperm was successfully retrieved in about 68 percent of the attempts. And clinical pregnancy rate was about 42 percent and there were a total of 44 kids born with normal karyotype. Higher sperm retrieval rates was obviously uh, in this subgroup of patients than previously reported because most of the time it's about 40 to 50 percent. However, in Kleinfelter syndrome, this was close to uh, 70 percent. In this subpopulation alone, medical therapy appears to make a significant uh, difference in the uh, outcome as well as the management. In men who have normal testosterone levels, they could directly undergo testicular sperm extraction and their retrieval rate was close to 85 percent. However, in men with impaired testosterone levels, if they started on aromatase inhibitors one milligram once a day, if there was a response with improvement in testosterone, they were left as is. If there was no response and the testosterone levels were still low, either HCG or clomiphene citrate was added. In men who underwent uh, medical therapy and had a final testosterone level of 250 prior to the microdissection tesi, their sperm retrieval rate was close to 77 percent versus men who did not respond to uh, medical therapy to improve their intratesticular testosterone then, and their serum testosterone, the sperm retrieval rate was close to 55 percent. So this illustrates a very good example of how uh, medical therapy uh, can actually change uh, surgical sperm retrieval success. So in summary, I hope I've illustrated the fact that varicoselectomy can improve both uh, natural conception as well as assisted reproduction uh, outcomes. Varicoselectomy and uh, varicocele treatment should not be offered for all couples. Uh, we should keep maternal age um, and maternal factors in the back of our mind and agree with the reproductive endocrinologist that uh, there are uh, the, the female fertility evaluation is normal and they do not need to undergo assisted reproduction for any of the maternal factors. I think varicoselectomy in that couple uh, probably offers the best chance of success with natural conception. And hopefully with the uh, second case I've illustrated that men with non-obstructive azoospermia can have a heterogeneous pattern of sperm production and therefore utilizing the uh, microscope to identify these areas of sperm production would be effective. And I've illustrated hopefully that the diagnostic biopsy is of limited benefit. It should be used only in men who have a normal FSH, a normal testis volume with azoospermia and should not be used in men with high FSH and a small testis 
because you could make the diagnosis just based on a clinical exam as well as hormonal evaluation. And hopefully I've illustrated that microdissection tesi can be effective for select patients such as men with Sertoli cell only syndrome as well as Klein-Felter syndrome. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, my mentors, uh, Peter Schlegel uh, from Cornell, as well as Larry Lipschultz and Dory Lamb uh, from Baylor, uh, without whose efforts uh, a lot of this work would not have been possible. And finally, uh, thank you to the ASRM uh, for oper offering this opportunity to present this webinar, and I look forward to uh, answering some of the questions and concerns uh, that uh, you guys may have. Thank you very much.